of 1812 is a little bit of a weird one. It was a war that occupied the single largest land theatre of the period. Yet it was largely fought by the B and C teams of one side for most of its duration, whilst for the other it was almost an existential crisis. The stated war goals of both sides, historically, are pretty much nothing like what pop culture likes to tell us they were. And it ended in the weird situation of the Americans winning a battle after the war was officially over, yet with the British in control of what amounted to about one and a half to two entire US states. It also saw a brief revival of the heretofore obsolete fourth rate, although as a large frigate as opposed to a small capital ship, and gave us non-oceanic ships of the line, as well as changing the course of the USA's economic expansion quite radically in some ways shaping the USA as we know it today. A discussion of the entire war is of course the matter of a multi-volume work. Even just the war at sea can be divided into three distinct sections. But we aren't going to be looking at the war on the high seas, or the war on the US coastline today. Instead, we're going to take a relatively in terms of all the scholarship that could be done on this matter, brief look at another unique aspect of the War of 1812, the all-out naval war on the Great Lakes, also occasionally called the War of the Carpenters, for reasons that will become more apparent later. One of the stated war aims of the Americans was the conquest, or liberation, of Canada. Of course, which one depends on which side you're actually on. But given the somewhat questionable, or rather non-existent, status of major road networks in and around the border areas, it was much, much easier to transport and supply men and equipment by ship, since at the time the parts of the USA and Canada that the warring parties were actually interested in were separated, for the most part, by the Great Lakes. Westward expansion hadn't really taken hold in a big way, and so whilst in theory, you could circumvent the entire issue by taking your troops on a 1,500-plus mile march around the western end of Lake Superior. It was widely and rightfully viewed as suicide, with the only question being whether it would be your men, the locals, or the weather that killed you first. Thus, in order to accomplish its war aims, the Americans needed control of the lakes. The British, by contrast, had to stop them to keep Canada safe, and take control of the lakes themselves if they wanted to conduct any serious offensives into the USA. Thomas Jefferson had a rather optimistic view on matters, writing at the start of the conflict that the liberation of Canada would be merely be a matter of marching into the arms of a grateful populace, which would then allow them to regroup and attack Halifax, which was the only place he expected the British to put up any kind of serious resistance and he thought this would all be done and dusted by 1813, and thus complete the expulsion of British authority on the North American continent. Ironically enough, it was actually mostly his own cuts to the American military during his earlier presidency that ha hamstrung much of the capability of American forces in the area to actually carry out this plan. Well, that and the fact that, of course, the Canadians were actually politely disinterested in becoming the next section of the United States. And so, in 1812, the early American offensives became something of a disaster, in no small part due to the starting position of the war being the British being in control of the lakes. At the time, this control was exerted by two small squadrons of four vessels each, comprising the Provincial Marine, one squadron cruising on Lake Ontario and the other on Lake Erie. The, la the former was based at Kingston, at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River on the northeastern side of Lake Ontario, and the latter was based at Amherstburg on the western end of Lake Erie. Amherstburg in particular enjoyed the rather interesting situation of being just at the other end of the Detroit River from, unsurprisingly enough, Detroit itself, and thus the American and British bases were pretty much right on top of each other. The British force on Lake Erie could also operate on Lake Huron with its smaller craft, uh, but its largest vessel was confined to Lake Erie by various low water marks. The ability to supply and guard the flanks of their own forces thus allowed a small British force under Major General Brock to force General Hull to surrender his invasion force at Detroit by the near-biblical tactic of marching his small force around the city several times to make it seem larger than it actually was. 
at the other end of the lake, an attempted invasion over the Niagara River by the Americans was likewise beaten back with heavy losses. The Provincial Marine had been around since pretty much the French had been a concern in Canada way back in the 1750s, but now it was pretty much tied into the army as effectively a heavily armed transport service. This, and the fact that there hadn't really been any major conflict since, meant that the squadrons lacked wartime experience, and so an initial attempt in July 1812 to take out the US naval base on Lake Ontario at Sackett's Harbour, which was a mere 35 miles away from Kingston, failed abysmally. Both sides were rapidly building new ships, helped by the fact that brigs and sloops were generally small craft which could be fairly quickly knocked together. The main restriction, generally, was actually the supply of specialist items such as block and tackle for rigging, masts, spars and sails, as well as guns and ammunition, which almost entirely had to be brought in from the two countries' respective east coasts. The Americans had the advantage of a slightly more developed inland transport network from ports such as Boston, New York and Baltimore, whilst the British had the advantage of the St. Lawrence River allowing them to land supplies at Montreal, which was physically much closer to the lakes, but then had a much less developed transportation network from Montreal heading west. By the time of this first attack on Sackett's Harbour, the Provincial Marine had enlisted a couple more vessels to give them a total strength of one sloop, three schooners, and two brigs, and was in the process of seeing if there were any more that they could grab. The American force consisted of a single brig, the USS Oneida, and was in the process of converting a number of schooners, both captured and enlisted, when a lookout aboard Oneida spotted most of the British force heading south towards them. This would be a constant feature of the war for Lake Ontario, with the two bases so close together that in good weather a man atop a particularly tall mast with a sharp eye or a telescope could spot enemy movements almost as soon as they'd left the harbour by looking out for sails. And after a brief voyage offshore, but still within loud hailing distance of your own base, you could actually observe the enemy harbour directly. Some idea of the small scale of the war and the ships involved, at this point at least, may be gained from this first major battle being decided in the Americans' favour by dismounting one broadside of the Oneida, which doubled the defensive firepower, as well as the use of a single 32-pounder gun, albeit using 24-pound shot and carpet wadding, as the 24-pound shot was the biggest ammunition they could actually find. The sum total of firepower on both sides combined would not have equaled one third-rate ship of the line, or even some of the larger frigates, and the the 32-pound gun, as we said, would be decisive, with a single shot badly damaging the British flagship HMS Royal George by raking it through the stern as it turned to bring its other broadside to bear. The only other American naval presence on the lakes at the time was the USS Adams, based at Detroit, but that was captured by the British, along with the rest of Detroit, and then shortly thereafter burned when the Americans tried to recapture it. After this brief flurry of activity, things settled down on both sides as they began to convert and build more vessels. The US Navy sent Commodore Isaac Chauncey to try and sort things out. Although ostensibly supposed to recover the situation on Lake Erie, he would end up focusing most of his attention on Lake Ontario instead. He brought in a number of skilled carpenters and shipwrights from the U.S. East Coast to help expand U.S. naval assets in the area and led a counter-raid on Kingston at the head of a small flotilla. But this was likewise repulsed, mostly by shore-based fortifications, but not helped by a gun exploding aboard one of his newly commissioned schooners. Unlike full-on oceanic naval war, The ships at this stage were small enough that even a relatively small set of land-based defences could prove quite effective. The first results of his building efforts would be the relatively powerful, for that year at least, sloop of war USS Madison, which more than doubled effective American firepower on the lake. It should be noted at this point that, depending on the source, the terms sloop and corvette are pretty much interchangeably used to describe small ships of between 16 and 24 guns. The winter weather would soon thereafter force a curtailment of war efforts in the area, bringing the operational side of the conflict in 1812 itself to a close, 
although the arrival of a number of Royal Navy officers in Kingston would see the Provincial Marines start a similar reorganisation and build-up over the upcoming months. As everyone settled in over the winter, the start of a naval arms race that would characterise much of the upcoming conflict began, with the British laying down a full-on 30-gun frigate at York, now Toronto, as well as two more sloops. As 1813 rolled around, the Americans would start work on a 24-gun frigate of their own, with a notable aspect of this competition being that the ships were designed to carry unusually heavy armaments for their size, a full battery of long 24-pounder guns in the Americans' case. This was in large part due to the ships not needing anywhere near as much displacement for supplies, owing to their relatively short operational radius, and also because they didn't have to be built to full-on oceanic standards of durability and stability, since in the face of bad weather, they could simply duck back into harbour. Chauncey also took the pause as a chance to go and inspect Lake Erie, identifying the somewhat originally named Erie, Pennsylvania, as a suitable place to begin similar construction activities, and he called in one Oliver Hazard Perry to take over as senior officer on that lake. Lake Erie, and by extension Lake Huron, were basically under British control following the surrender of American forces at Detroit for the duration of 1812, largely on the basis of no substantial vessels actually being present to challenge the British, which kind of helped. As the ice began to recede in the spring of 1813, the British would also receive further reinforcements in the form of men and supplies led by Commodore Sir James Yeo, who would become Chauncey's opposite number and primary adversary for the next stage of the conflict. With Kingston still largely ice-bound, Chauncey wanted to wait until it was clear and then assault it directly. But with an election coming up in New York State, political pressure from the president, who wanted support for his Republican Party to be bolstered, meant that an attack was launched earlier than planned in late April 1813, aimed instead at York, which was already free of ice. With the Oneida and Madison leading a 14-strong naval squadron, the other 12 being a mix-up of smaller vessels, and with the bulk of the provincial marines still trapped in Kingston, the Americans were able to land troops, drive off the garrison, burn the 30-gun frigate HMS Sir Isaac Brock, which was named after the recently fallen general, whilst it was still under construction, and also managed to make off with the HMS Duke of Gloucester, a brig that was partially dismantled and under repair at the time. Renamed the York, she would be used as a powder storage vessel at Sackett's Harbour. The main source of casualties was actually the town's Grand Magazine, which blew up, causing 260 casualties amongst the attacking troops. This raid radically shifted the balance of naval power, as with the loss of the Brock, the Provincial Marine would not have anything to match the upcoming US frigate when it completed. Bad weather and poor discipline weakened the troops used in the assault, which then delayed the subsequent follow-up assault of Fort George until about a month after the start of the operation against York. Nevertheless, the attack against Fort George, which, like York, was at the western end of the lake, was a stunning success, capturing the fort mostly intact with minimal losses, although the bulk of the British forces were able to withdraw, in part thanks to the delay. This gave the Americans a base at the western end of Lake Ontario and control over the entrance to the Niagara River, with Oliver Hazard Perry's command of the schooners in close support of the troops being noted as exceptional. Once again, control of the lakes had allowed the transport, deployment and support of troops who would almost certainly have never managed to march the length of the lake and conduct an assault in anything like so good a condition. You might well ask what the British were doing at this point, since the ice was now mostly gone. Well, in part, they were undergoing a change in command, with the naval officers who'd taken up command of the Provincial Marine now being displaced by Commodore Yeo's cadre, with Yeo dispatching his predecessors to various naval command roles on Lake Erie and Lake Champlain. Yeo's first major command decision was to load all available troops onto his vessels and attack Sackett's Harbour again, whilst the main American force was distracted at the other end of the lake with force Fort George. Hampered at first by bad weather, the operation appeared to start well, as they intercepted and captured contingents of the 9th and 21st Infantry, who were sailing in small boats to reinforce Sackett's Harbour. But the delay 
gave the Americans the chance to reinforce their defences, since the vessels used for the interception had been in the process of sailing in to effect a landing at Sackett's Harbour itself. With the demise of General Brock, the army side of the operation was led by General Prevost, who would prove to be a far less than satisfactory replacement. Although the wind prevented most of the British ships from closing in to support the landings, the operation was still going quite well, with most of the initial American defences falling quickly, being manned by militia whose morale failed very rapidly in the face of combat against British regulars. It was only when the British ran into their American counterparts of regular troops that resistance began to stiffen. The last major bastion of defence was Fort Tompkins, which was brought under fire by HMS Beresford, which forced the American artillerymen manning it to fall back. A few of the shots from Beresford went long and landed in the dockyard. This apparently convinced the officers present that the fort had fallen rather than being suppressed, and thus the way to the dockyard was in theory open. So concerned were they by the British potentially seizing supplies and the ships under construction that they set fire to all the warehouses, and also to the new frigate, the USS General Pike, in order to deny them to the British. This, along with some rallying amongst US militia, gave a confused picture that Prevost and his second-in-command, Baines, took to mean that some nebulous and ill-defined element of their forces had somehow reached the dockyards past the fort that was definitely not in their hands at this point, and set fire to the dockyard themselves. But at the same time, they took the rallied militia for some form of reinforcement, although the rest of the American line was clearly almost done thanks to HMS Beresford's efforts. In their infinite confused wisdom, they thus decided to call off the whole operation and retreat, much to the annoyance of practically every other officer and man present, including Yo, who disembarked to lead a small company of marines. As everyone else was pretty convinced that total victory was less than an hour away. As it was, the fires cost the Americans half a million dollars of supplies and equipment, which was a huge amount for the time, and would cause significant problems for them later in the year. It also destroyed the Hulk, York, and which was the ex-HMS Duke of Gloucester, which was captured earlier at York, as we said before, and it also damaged the frigate General Pike, Luckily, the new frigate was not made of seasoned timber, but rather green wood, and so didn't actually burn very easily. And so, when the British started to withdraw, the fires aboard General Pike were relatively easily put out and construction resumed, with the British falling back to Kingston with little to show for their efforts apart from a bunch of casualties. Nonetheless, the operation put a pause on combat on the lake, as Chauncey returned and would then keep the bulk of his forces at Sackett's Harbour in order to guard against a second possible assault until the pike could be made operational, as Chauncey was under no illusion of just how close a th run thing it had been. The British also completed a brig, but with the USS General Pike entering service, the American line of battle on Lake Ontario would have 112 guns to the British 97, with the Pike itself standing head and shoulders over every other combatant. The weight of gunfire was also well in the Americans' favour, far beyond the numerical advantage, as the Pike's armament of long 24-pounders was considerably heavier than anything the British had. Nonetheless, this pause in American operations until the Pike was ready allowed the British and their native allies to blockade the recently captured Fort George from the landward side, and so at the end of July, Chauncey sailed to try and relieve the fort, but found the land-based defences of the British too strong to assault. Instead, he swung past York on the way back to loot some more supplies, since he correctly identified that the reason for the Fort George blockade being so strong was that most of York's defenders had been sent over there to bolster the blockading force. This operation was successful in grabbing some small boats, some cannon, and some flour, but they also politely returned all the library books which the troops had looted earlier in the year during the first sacking of York. That was very nice of them. Finally, on the 7th of August, the two forces would finally meet in battle, as Yo's squadron appeared at the mouth of the Niagara River. The weather was hugely variable, rather a constant feature of lake warfare, and forced multiple changes in tactics and formation. 
Although no full-on grand battle developed, the American advantage was reduced somewhat as during the skirmishing two schooners capsized in a squall on the night of the 8th, and then on the 10th when it finally looked like a proper battle might be starting, with both squadrons closing in on each other under fire, a navigation error sent the schooners Growler and Julia into the British formation, where they were promptly captured. Down a total of four schooners, and with the wind against him, Chauncey withdrew to resupply. The loss of 24 guns from the four schooners put the American squadron at a slight disadvantage in terms of number of guns, but they still had the general pike, and so still retained the weight of firepower. Similar skirmishes along Lake Ontario would continue. On the 11th of September, Chauncey found Yeo's squadron becalmed just east of the Niagara and commenced a long-range bombardment, using his advantage in heavy long guns to best effect. This might have been the end of the struggle for control of the lake if not for a sudden breeze that allowed the British vessels to withdraw, the American squadron being unable to pursue due to the USS Oneida and a number of smaller vessels being somewhat sluggish in the light airs and Chauncey being unwilling to split his command and leave one of his larger ships behind. A couple of weeks later, the two squadrons would run into each other once again in the western end of the lake, with Chauncey having partially resolved the speed issue by having the Asp, Ontario and Fair American, the worst of his sailing vessels, towed by the General Pike, Sylph and Madison. Whilst the British tried to concentrate on the weaker American schooners at the rear of the line, Chauncey doubled back aboard the Pike and engaged the British flagship Wolf in a vicious short-range action, bringing down two of its masts and putting Yo in danger of being captured. At this point, however, the day was saved by HMS Royal George placing itself between the Pike and the stricken flagship, for forcing Chauncey to deal with the smaller vessel, which was still a major threat at short range owing to the battery of heavy carronades that it carried, which allowed it to match the Pike's broadside weight for weight in close action. This gave time for the Wolf to sort itself out and begin a withdrawal, with the engagement ending in a general pursuit by the Americans that was curtailed by the weather shifting yet again, and Chauncey evaluating that with the pike damaged by British shot and a number of its own guns either exploding or splitting, and with the weather threatening to drive everyone ashore onto British-held territory, a continued pursuit would almost inevitably lead to any and all ships that actually survived being recovered from the shore and ending up in British service, and so it was best to withdraw. Whilst the engagement itself hadn't led to any major losses on either side, the greater damage to the British squadron handed the Americans temporary command of Lake Ontario, whilst the Provincial Marine retired to repair. This would then allow the American squadron to capture a small convoy of British ships and reposition the army from Fort George, which, as it turned out, wasn't actually accomplishing all that much, back to Sackett's Harbour in preparation for the planned attack on Montreal, which was scheduled for 1814. After a handful of skirmishes, the army began to move down the St Lawrence to set up its winter camp for this assault. But Yeo's squadron was now repaired, and with blockade difficult due to increasingly foul weather, a small detachment of British vessels managed to head after them, and with troops aboard would help to defeat the American forces at the highly confused and improbable Battle of Chrysler's Farm, which thus ended the threat to Montreal. The loss of this force meant that more troops were drawn from the Niagara area and moved by ship to Sackett's Harbour. This dilution of force would then lead to the British success in the capture of Fort Niagara and the Battle of Buffalo toward the end of the year, with the latter resulting in the burning of three schooners and a sloop from the Lake Erie formation. Then the weather and ice closed in on a Lake Ontario that was pretty much back to a state of an armed standoff, as both sides set to their winter building programs. Meanwhile, however, on Lake Erie, things had been much more exciting. Starting from a sum total of nothing, Oliver Hazard Perry began work first on completing two brigs that his predecessor had started, and then bringing into action a collection of smaller vessels based at Black Rock, where prior British control of Fort Erie had impounded them. Whilst Commander Barclay, on the British side, was struggling to complete the HMS Detroit due to a shortage of supplies, and the fact that trained Royal Navy personnel on the lake numbered a grand total of Eight. 
including himself. The rest being a mixture of pre-war provincial marine personnel and soldiers who'd been drafted in to make up the numbers, neither of whom Barclay particularly rated as good mariners. Whilst Perry was sorting out his own craft, the British maintained a close blockade on the opposite side of the sandbar that protected the American harbour. But by the end of July, when Barclay was distracted, Perry managed to move the bulk of his forces across the sandbar by stripping them of their guns and then sending the lightened ships through the shallow water, with the guns following on on barges. This establishment of force, with Perry having superior numbers and HMS Detroit as yet incomplete, forced Barclay to withdraw, which led to the tables being turned and Barclay now being the one being blockaded in his own home port of Amherstburg. With supplies running low, by early September, Barclay had no choice but to try and break the blockade. The British in this scenario had a slight advantage in firepower using long-range guns, and they had one more large warship, at least for a given value of large, but their force only amounted to six vessels in total, whilst the American force was nine strong, with three large and six smaller vessels. And in a close action... The Americans were the ones with a considerable firepower advantage, thanks to a preponderance of short-range carronades, with a total of about two and a half times the overall weight of shot. Both of these factors were borne out as the Battle of Putin Bay began to develop. With the winds light, the battle started badly for the Americans, as the eclectic assortment of long guns aboard HMS Detroit battered away at Perry's flagship, the USS Lawrence, with relative impunity for quite some time with the other major American warship, the USS Niagara, being somewhat slow to come into supporting range, possibly being blocked from advance by USS Caledonia being out of position. The Niagara's ostensible opposite number, HMS Queen Charlotte, saw the confusion in the American line and decided to head over to join in the battering of the Lawrence. Fairly soon, the Lawrence therefore became unmanageable, and Perry had to be rowed to the Niagara whilst the flagship surrendered. However, at the same time, the other British ships had been suffering at the hands of the small American vessels, many of whom were armed with a tiny number of guns, three of them only carrying a single weapon. But all the small American ships had at least one heavy long gun, even when it was the only gun they had aboard, and with these, they'd been causing heavy damage to the small British ships, which carried more but smaller guns. And thus, in a kind of ship-borne sniper action, these smaller British ships had ended up in almost a reverse situation to the USS Lawrence, being shot from far beyond their effective range. Still, the Detroit and Queen Charlotte could now, in theory, turn on the Niagara and then mop up the lesser craft but the two large British ships had sustained casualties amongst the officers and had had their rigging quite badly shot up. As a result, they were becoming unmanageable and collided. Whilst they were sorting this out, Perry led the relatively undamaged Niagara into a raking position on both ships, whilst his smaller craft fired at them from astern. By the time the Detroit and Queen Charlotte had disentangled themselves from each other, it was far too late and the damage had racked up. Both ships surrendered, and were quickly followed by the smaller vessels, as they were rapidly overhauled, overwhelmed, and captured. Perry would then recapture the USS Lawrence in order to receive the enemy surrender aboard his own flagship, before sending off his famous dispatch that started with, We have met the enemy, and they are ours. This decisive victory, which in naval terms would be the single most decisively fought engagement of all the conflicts on the Great Lakes, gave the Americans complete control over Lake Erie, which would not be lost for the rest of the war, and during 1913 this would then allow Perry to perform the vital task of any Great Lakes naval force, which was ferrying troops. In particular, this allowed him to bring American troops over to capture Amherstburg, and then to recapture Detroit which would then lead on to the Battle of the Thames, where the Native American leader Tecumseh was killed, shattering the alliance of tribes that he'd built and forcing the British into a purely defensive posture in this area of operations for the rest of the war, as they'd relied quite heavily on Tecumseh's alliance as an ally. <laughs> 
Although, as mentioned earlier, four of the Lake Erie flotilla would be destroyed by the British later in the year during the Battle of Buffalo. Lake Champlain was relatively quiet. A small American force had been established in late 1812, but had been rapidly countered by a similar British force, which captured a couple of American sloops early in 1813, thus turning the numerical tables quite decisively and giving the British uncontested superiority for the rest of 1813, which would allow them to conduct a number of small raids and other operations in the area. But overall, this, the smallest of the lake operational areas, was relatively quiet during 1813. Then the year marched forward to 1814, and things began to change once again. In 1812 and 1813, practically anything that floated that you could stick a cannon on was useful. Even a small schooner with a single long gun had been a somewhat effective combatant. Now, the winter building program of 1813-14 to would change all that. First out of the blocks was Yo. He'd renamed a lot of his fleet to introduce some uniformity and to stop duplication with Royal Navy ships on the oceans that shared the same names as some of his ships had previously. He'd also started construction on two large frigates, HMS Prince Regent and HMS Princess Charlotte. The latter was a large 42-gun fifth-rate, whilst the former was a solid fourth-rate pretty much halfway between a frigate and a small ship of the line. The days of the USS General Pike being the most fearsome thing on the lakes were well and truly over. Again, both these ships mounted unusually heavy guns, even for ships of their size, on hulls that were much lighter than their oceanic counterparts due to the restrictions of freshwater lake operation. Due to starting first, the two British ships were ready for service soon after the ice broke up, and this was enough for operations to begin, with Yo taking full advantage, initially considering yet another attack on Sackett's Harbour, in large part to stop or delay the American response to his new ships. But the troops needed to attack the now much stronger fortifications were not forthcoming, thanks mostly to General Prevost. Instead, Yo took aim at the small village of Oswego and its accompanying fort, which was the last major staging point for supplies coming up to Chauncey from New York. At that point, most of the guns for one of the new American frigates were either on their way or being stored there, at least according to intelligence, and so an attack and seizure would not only neuter the building efforts in Sackett's Harbour, as a ship without guns was pretty useless, but it would also allow Yo to rearm some of his smaller vessels with bigger and nastier cannon and carronades having just relieved the Americans of them. In early May, a landing was attempted, but once again Yo's luck with the weather ran badly, and a southerly wind made it impossible for the ships to provide fire support, resulting in a delay to the landing until next day. This allowed the defenders to reposition most of their own guns along the line of expected attack. Despite most of the British regulars having had their powder soaked and made useless in the landings, between fixed bayonets and a blistering fire support from the two new frigates, the fort was overcome and captured, although losses were higher than ideal thanks to the almost complete absence of musketry on the British side. They then set about happily looting food and military supplies, captured a few schooners, although this was somewhat less important than it would have been at the same time the previous year, including the USS Growler, which we mentioned earlier, which had started life in American service, been captured during the skirmishing last year, then recaptured, and was now being re-recaptured. However, only seven of the guns that were intended for the new American frigates had actually reached Oswego. The other 21 were still en route, albeit they weren't that far away. Blockading Sackett's harbour with his major vessels, Yo sent small gunboats and other lesser vessels to intercept the shipment. But after a series of manoeuvres, this would eventually fail at the end of the month at the Battle of Big Sandy Creek, with an ambush by American forces and Oneida native allies, which would see the remaining guns safely delivered. Although he'd been able to slow down the transfer of weapons, Having failed to prevent it, Yo was now faced with Chauncey deploying the rather aptly named USS Superior and the USS Mohawk, as well as two overgunned brigs, the Jones and Jefferson, by the end of July. 
which evened up the numbers of serious warships on the lake, but gave the Americans the overall advantage, as their ships were individually, generally slightly larger, and more heavily armed. This escalation of force can be seen from the fact that the early flag and lead ships on, two, on the two sides, the USS Oneida, the USS Madison, the HMS Royal George, and the HMS Wolf, the latter two now named the Niagara and Montreal, respectively, were now, at best, second line, and at worst, a bottom of the pile of the two squadrons' respective battle lines, with the small schooners and such like that they had previously led being relegated to largely auxiliary roles. A combination of the British-caused delays to supplies as well as personal illness caused an overall delay in Chauncey's sailing, but when he did so, as July turned into August, Lake Ontario now became an American lake with the Provincial Marine again falling back to Kingston. The Americans used this opportunity to extend their lead, destroying a small brig that was under construction, and then chasing down the HMS Magnet, formerly the HMS Sir Sidney Smith, and forcing her to be burnt as well. This further extended their lead, even if the Magnet was the smallest of the Provincial Marine's effective combatants. However, the reinforced defences at York prevented the American squadron from making a third successful assault on the town. But it was at this point that Chauncey made an error, and he began to treat the whole situation as if it was an oceanic naval command, and so he kept the bulk of his forces blockading Kingston, just in case Yo came out for battle, which Yo had no intention of doing any time soon. In so doing, Chauncey forgot the vital role of transport and supply that the naval squadrons on the lakes played, the lack of support contributing to the land campaign around the Niagara River stalling out, and also allowing the smaller British ships blockaded there by Chauncey's own smaller craft to send some of their crews upriver to board and capture a couple of American schooners on Lake Erie, further diminishing the strength of the American squadron stationed there. But Yo wasn't a complete idiot, and hadn't gambled everything on simply being able to stop the Americans' construction efforts. Instead, just before the ice had melted in the spring, he'd begun construction on a full-on lake-bound ship of the line. At first, the plan had been for a 74-gun third-rate, but Yo had altered the plans. Using equipment and weapons taken from three 74-gunners in Montreal Harbour, his shipwrights once again took advantage of the non-oceanic nature of the theatre to omit significant supply storage as well as the quarterdeck and forecastle, thus allowing the rapid construction of the 112-gun ship of the line that was dimensionally larger and far more heavily armed than Nelson's HMS Victory, carrying a similar lower and middle gun deck batteries, but mounting a full array of 32-pounders on the upper gun deck, instead of the 12-pounders that were more typically found on ocean-going vessels. This ship, the HMS St. Lawrence, was launched on the 10th of September, with the Americans trying everything from direct challenge to battle, to an early floating mine, to apparently calling on the weather gods to try and stop the ship completing, as, amongst other things, it was hit by lightning on the 19th of October. But by mid-October, the ship was in service, and the balance of power had swung almost definitively back towards the British. So now it was Chauncey's turn to hide under blockade, whilst Yo, presumably laughing in British from the bridge of HMS St. Lawrence, set about reasserting his dominance. Although he too would now fall afoul of monofocus, and promptly sat outside Sackett's Harbour, likewise neglecting many of the supply and transport duties that were the actual point of any Lake Squadron's existence. And that pretty much wrapped up the campaign on Lake Ontario in 1813 before the ice closed in again, with both sides now aware of just how much things had escalated, they both settled in to build their way to victory in 1815. The Americans starting work on two new ships of the line, the USS New Orleans and the USS Chippewa, along with the USS Plattsburgh, which would have been about the size of a large fourth-rate or possibly a small third-rate. On the British side, two further ships of the line, HMS Wolf and HMS Canada, were laid down, along with HMS Psyche, a mid-sized fourth-rate, tentatively indicating that the British would just about have maintained superiority on the lake in the following year, assuming no major upsets. 
Over on Lake Erie during 1814, apart from annoying schooner losses, not much else was happening. But just upriver on Lake Huron, things were different. Oliver Hazard Perry had headed off to the U.S. East Coast to take up a role in the oceanic part of the U.S. Navy, and this was about as far west as British and American colonisation had gotten at this point, and so Lake Huron was broadly under British control, with the sole American outpost being Fort Mackinac on an island of the same name. But this had been captured at the start of the war by British forces and their native allies, who'd taken advantage of the fact that the fort's garrison hadn't actually been told that war had been declared yet, and so they just snuck up to it and took it without a fight from the unsuspecting garrison. Whilst Perry's victory on Lake Erie had changed the situation nearby, by the time the operations to mop up British forces on the lake and retake Detroit had been completed, winter had set in and it was too late to do anything about the otherwise defenceless Lake Huron. But by 1814, there now was time, and shipping, available, and so in July an expedition of the three largest brigs and two gunboats from the Lake Erie squadron set out to retake the former American fort. This did not go especially well, as, thanks to navigation errors, fog, and quite badly mistaken intelligence, the British ended up having plenty of warning that the Americans were coming, and were ready and waiting. With a neat killing ground set up by the defenders, along with broken terrain stalling the advance, and the excellent field craft of the British forces' native allies allowing them to ambush the attackers, the Americans were driven off. With this failure, meaning that the remaining militia needed to be sent back, the remaining brig and two gunboats were looking for British supply posts, and they found one at Nottawasaga, along with a British schooner that had been used for supply runs. An attack here had more success, forcing the British to scuttle the schooner and destroy a small fortification, but most of the supplies were either missed or well hidden. The resulting blockade was, though, having the desired effect, forcing the victorious garrison on Mackinac to go on to half rations. But in early September, another combined operation by British troops and their native allies saw a nighttime raid which succeeded in capturing the USS Tigris, which was then left in exactly the same position for its fellow gunboat USS Scorpion to find. Once the Scorpion came into view, the Tigris pulled alongside and then swarmed its hapless sister ship with British troops. Now, with two out of the three American ships on the lake in British control, and USS Niagara, although larger and more heavily armed, having been badly damaged in a storm, the British regained control of the lake and would set about building a small flotilla, including a frigate, as winter closed in. The last theatre in this round was Lake Champlain. Although not featuring all that much in the previous years, it had likewise seen a busy program of overwinter building, and five American vessels, along with twice as many gunboats, now faced off against five British vessels and 13 gunboats. But unlike the situations on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, when both sides had been evenly matched numerically, in this case, the largest American vessel was the 26-gun corvette USS Saratoga. Whilst the British had just completed the 36-gun HMS Confiance, giving them the firepower advantage. With a land invasion by British regulars transferred from Europe in the offing, this caused the British commander to become overconfident and sail straight at Lieutenant McDonough's American squadron. And worse still, to do so in the face of a light headwind. As a result, the slowly closing British ships were badly mauled on their approach by the American gun crews. Still, the heavier weight of the British ships, and the heavier weight of their guns, allowed them to open up a vicious, if haphazard, close-range action, with the two flagships battering each other into a stalemate of dismounted guns and dying men. But McDonough, being the prepared defender, was then able to use his mooring ropes and springs to spin the Saratoga around and open fire with his previously unengaged side, rapidly forcing the helpless Confiance to surrender. With their flagship out of action and the Saratoga positioning to take out the next largest British vessel, the situation rapidly degraded until all but the smallest British ships had been forced to surrender, with the fastest and most agile being forced to withdraw. <laughs> 
As a result, despite having a slight upper hand in the land engagement taking place nearby at the Battle of Plattsburgh, the British ground forces were then forced to retreat, as once again, a loss of the ability to contest the lake meant the loss of ability to resupply and transport troops, and so the British land position became untenable. This victory, combined with the defence of Baltimore a few days later, left both sides without much leverage at the negotiating table, which the British had previously held thanks to the burning of Washington and the start of incursions onto US soil. Thus balanced, control of the Great Lakes would end up being negotiated to be not held exclusively by the British, but rather open to both parties, with a further treaty cancelling the construction of further warships on the lake, as well as in theory limiting their existing squadrons to one vessel each, each armed with a single gun. However, despite the end of the war, neither side was in any rush to dismantle their ships. Although the American vessels, mostly roughly finished in Greenwood, quickly fell into disrepair, the British managed to maintain their ships for a little longer, building a large stone storehouse where the rigging and other fittings were carefully kept, in theory allowing them to bring their entire lake fleet back into service in under a week. But by the late 1820s, their ships were also in disrepair, and so the war would end with Lakes Erie and Champlain in American hands, with efforts on Champlain to rebuild by the British ongoing, whilst Huron and Ontario were definitively and partially under British control, respectively. All told, although both Chauncey and Yeo would attract criticism for not acting boldly enough, perhaps the only real key engagement of, in the campaigns on these four lakes where a single changed battle could have affected the war as a whole, and the decisive change in the battle being relatively plausible, would have been that last one on Lake Champlain. If the British commander had waited for more favourable weather, or even neutral weather, in to commence his attack, then the negotiations at Ghent would have ended with a large column of British troops deep into the American northeastern states, which would likely have significantly changed things at the negotiation negotiating table by giving the British a significant amount of leverage. Nonetheless, the rapidly escalating arms race on the Great Lakes in the War of 1812, as well as what it achieved, remains an often less explored, but nonetheless fascinating microcosm of the larger conflict. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.